předsednictvo.
Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome on the afternoon session. So, uh, the first speaker is Carlos Merino with Centrality Dependence of multi strange Particle Production in Heavy Iron Collisions at High Energies. You have 12 minutes plus free for discussion. Okay, so thank you so much. And I'll uh, present this work that is perhaps a little bit aside, aside from most talks in this conference. Uh, this is the title of my talk, and this is work done in collaboration with professors Arakelian and Shavelsky. Okay, the, the aim of this, of our work, is to try to describe the multi-strange variants and antivariants uh, productions at high energy. As all we know, it's a valuable probe of in order to understand the particle production mechanism in high energy physics. physics. So we'll compare, uh, in particular, experimental ratios of multi-strange to strange antivarium production on nuclear targets. Sorry. A different a different energies in the range from SPS to LAC. Okay. We will try to make a description using this very well known and established quark gluon string model. The point is that it's a remarkable feature in principle of strangeness production at high energy that the production of is each additional squark featuring in the secondary variants, in the produced variants, is affected by one universal strangeness called suppression factor by comparison with non-strange quarks, which is defined, universally defined like this, where these are uh, yields of produced particles. Uh, this implies some uh, very simple combinatorics. We can define the ratios to compare the production of uh, D and DY in the nuclear collisions go, going to cas anti cascade or an to anti lambda, anti omega to anti lambda. And uh, well, the, these ratios are reasonably described by the model when a relatively small number of incident nucleons participate in the collision. That is for either nucleon nucleus collisions or peripheral nucleus nucleus collisions. Okay, um, I'll just jump all the part connected with the theoretical uh, uh, formalism of the model, just to say that the quark gluon model is based on dual topological unitarization, regi phenomenology, and non-perturbative features of QCD, and um, it considers the, the um, uh, high energy interactions as proceeding via the exchange of one or several this uh, uh, so-called, uh, this called pomeron. By cutting these pomerons, we obtain the inelastic uh, diagrams, okay? Okay, for the, this model has been used for many years, and it gives a successful description of multi-particle production in hadron-hadron and nucleus-nucleus, nu hadron-nucleus and nucleus-nucleus collisions for a wide energy range. Okay, that's, those slides are concerned the, the formalism of the model. To pass from hadron-hadron collisions to collisions with a nuclear uh, uh, target, we use the gribov global theory. And okay, again, this, uh, this so-called superposition picture of quark gluon stream model gives again a reasonable description of inclusive spectra on nuclear targets at energy in the range of uh, square root of S from 14 to 30 GeV. Okay. Uh, this, if we go at higher energies, weak energies, we see that this superposition uh, picture declines in the sense that uh, these so-called screening corrections have, have, have to be added to the, to the diagrams considered, and this is made uh, in a clear and clean way in the model. 
and finally this part of the calculation is is very similar to, to what it's done in the so-called percolation approach. Okay, here in this work we have compared our results and predictions with sorry, with first fixed target energy data, then star collaboration data, and finally LHC data. Those are the data we have used at SPS uh, Energies. These are first table with the first results for the NDY in the uh, mid rapidity range, the experimental data, the theoretical values. Again, a second table uh, for lead lead and producing all these strange uh, states. Okay, so we can say that uh, we, we obtain a set for secondary protons and uh, lambdas a reasonable description, but on the contrary, for the case of multi strange hyperon production. Ah, sorry, sorry. Yes, yes, sorry, sorry. For the case of, of uh, multi strange hyperon production, a correct description of the experimental data can only be obtained by taking a significantly larger values of the so-called suppression, uh, strangeness suppression factor, what is in principle uh, not supported by the, the idea, the theoretical definition of the parameter. Uh, so in this sense, this fact is a clear indication of a significant violation of the so-called quark combinatorial rules, a very, uh, uh, a straightforward uh, feature of the theoretical approach. And that's where we can see more clearly this effect if we compare the ratios of anti-omega to anti-lambda, anti-cascade to anti-lambda. In uh, the, ra the, the ratio of the yields versus the the participant nucleons in the collision, what it's a kind of describing the centrality of the collisions. So dash line is calculation with a constant uh, strangeness suppression parameter, continuous line, uh, full line, it's the result of the calculation with a growing value of this uh, suppression parameter value, okay, with a, uh, Variable, variable uh, parameter. So the necessity of using different values of strangeness suppression factor to correctly describe the production of both strange and multi-strange, in particular multi-strange hadrons at SPS, is, be, is made evident by this increase of the ratios and uh, it can only be uh, due to a variation of this strangeness suppression parameter since all other parameters in the model are uh, remain invariant, okay? Um, in particular, for the ratio anti-omega to anti-lambda, the, the difference between the two calculations can, becomes of the order of, uh, becomes of, of one order of magnitude, okay? It's, very important. We have compared also with, we made a description of collabor a star collaboration data, okay, some table that here you can even not read, but it is in the paper. The figure, the experimental points obtained by the star collaboration compared with the, for the ratios instead, uh, versus again the, the centrality of the collision for gold-gold collisions. Again, uh, the, the two calculations now are different, but not so, so different as they were for the SPS case. Now the difference is not very, very important. So again, we see that in the case, case of multi strangeness uh, production, the suppression factor deviates uh, slightly from the constant value, but the difference is not as important as for the case of SPS energies, what is somehow puzzling. Hmm? Uh, 
actually we can say by looking at the description of the data that the violation of the quark combinatorial rule decreases with the growth of the energy of the collision one. In principle, one would expect the contrary. Okay? If, if any change would happen. We have compared also with LHC results. Those are the reference of the papers. Lead, lead uh, collisions at two energies. Okay, here we have produced just the table. Again, for particles produced in the central, in the central rapidity range. Okay. And again, we can see that now for the case of LAC uh, experimental data, we can obtain a very good description of the data with the almost practically constant value of the strangeness um, suppression factor and with the value for this parameter the same as it was used originally to describe the production in nucleon-nucleon um, or a proton-proton or uh, peripheral uh, nuclear collisions, okay? So it seems uh, surprising, but the value of the lambda S also decreases with, the, with respect of RIC and it decreased before from RIC with respect to SPS. So it's uh, puzzling for us in principle, okay? Um, okay, so just uh, I come to my conclusions. By comparing the quark gluon string model predictions for a strength, a strange and multi-strange production in hadronic and nuclear collisions at high energies, we observe the following effect in the experimental data. I want to stress that it's not a theoretical effect. A, uh, um, it's something you ob directly observe in the experimental data when you try to describe the data with the theoretical formalism. And the main point is that the experimental dependence on centrality of the ratios anti-omega over anti-lambda and anti-cascade over anti-lambda in nuclear collisions at SPS energies shows that the strangeness suppression factor depends on centrality. And this is a new feature we have not uh, observed before, never before, and that what it's also neither in proton-proton, neither in light nuclear collisions, and what is perhaps more important, this all is, it has to be checked, in particular by our experimental friends. This effect that we observe at SPS energies is not observed, is not observed when we compare with the available uh, corresponding experimental data uh, at RIC and LAC energies. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very interesting uh, talk. Any question, comments? So, let me ask a question regarding your last uh, statement from conclusion part. So, you said that this effect, which is observed at SPS, is not observed at top RIC, at RIC and LHC. So, do you plan to also take a look at lower RIC energies? As you know, STAR experiment is able to go down with collision energy very low to 3 GeV data. So, maybe it would be... Yes, I mean... We actually, we could try, as you have, as you have seen, we have uh, described also as far data, higher range. Ah, sorry, yes. sorry. We, we have described already star data, but a higher energy range. Yes, our idea is try to, to look into all data we could use to check, but we would like also to ask for the help of our experimental colleagues working in the multi-strange production in those high energy collisions to look from the experimental point whether they see any effect. Okay, thank you. Do we have any more questions? So I don't see, so let's thank our speaker once thank more. You. Thank you.
And now we can move forward to uh, our, our second speaker. I think Zuzana is coming. Zuzana will, oh. Zuzana will speak about probing partonic collectivity in large and small collision systems with strange hadrons in Alice. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, thanks to the organizer for having me. Uh, as it was said, I will be talking about probing protonic collectivity in large and small collision systems with strange hadrons, or also strange hadrons in Alice. So first of all, because not everybody uh, here is uh, uh, that familiar with uh, heavy ions, uh, then I would like to very briefly introduce the concept of quark-gluon plasma, but I believe most of you already heard about it. Uh, so it's a hot and dense nuclear matter of deconfined quarks and gluons and strongly interacting liquid, and it existed right after the Big Bang. We can recreate it in a laboratory by colliding ultra-relative heavy ion collisions so we can create these little Big Bangs. And uh, when, when we create these little big banks, there are several stages we are interested in. For example, at the very beginning, initial conditions, of course, uh, we can study, for example, the geometry of the nuclei overlap and its fluctuations, and then the QGP is formed, and it, uh, it uh, undergoes a hydrodynamic expansion, and we can, which is sensitive to the energy state, and uh, with this expansion, we can, we can learn a lot of uh, properties of a quark gluon plasma, such as shear and bulk viscosities, and then this uh, medium uh, went through hadronization and freeze out, and then it reaches our detector, and we, and we can measure that. And by our detector, I mean the ALICE detector, or, or having an ion uh, detector at the LHC. There are several sub-detectors we are uh, interested in the most for this analysis uh, presented later on, and that's the inner tracking system, which is the, uh, the innermost one, uh, which uh, is uh, doing tracking and also triggering. For triggering, we also have V0 detectors, so the forward detector, which uh, except triggering, it also, uh, it's also used for event multiplicity determination. And then we have uh, very close to V0, we have forward multiplicity detector, which is, uh, as its name suggests, uh, determining forward multiplicity uh, with the unique pseudorapidity coverage, actually the largest coverage out of all LAC experiments. Then we have in the central barrel, the, the blue one here, time projection chamber, which is uh, responsible for tracking and a particle identification via uh, the specific energy loss. And then uh, the, the, the orange one here, that's the time of flight detector, which we're using for part particle identification uh, using the velocity of uh, individual particles. And I will be uh, talking about collectivity. Uh, by collectivity, I will mostly mean flow. Uh, and uh, to introduce you briefly to the concept of flow. So if we have two these uh, heavy uh, nuclei colliding, ultra elasticity collision, uh, then they, uh, and if the collision is not exactly head-on, so exactly central, uh, then the overlap of the nuclei is only partial. So we, we obs are observing uh, spatial anisotropy. Uh, this also means that it's, uh, uh, it will create a different pressure gradients for particles are pushed out of the plane with the preferred direction and they uh, flow anisotropically in the transfer place. We can uh, quantify it, uh, the flow using so-called flow coefficients, this Vn, which is obtained from the Fourier expansion of uh, final state particles. And this, uh, we are mostly interested in uh, Vn, so the, the elliptic flow, v, v, uh, sorry, V2 elliptic flow, V3 triangular flow, uh, and so on. And these, we are studying these coefficients because they uh, can provide uh, detailed information on the initial conditions and also transfer properties of uh, the created medium. And we can, as you can see here, in the flow measurement as a, as a function of centrality. Uh, so here we, have the, yeah, here we have the most central collision in this region, and here there's more peripheral collisions. Uh, we, can, we can describe this data by uh, hydrodynamic models. But as you can see, if we would have only this measurement, so PT integrated as a function of centrality, we would not be able to really distinguish between different hydrodynamic models. That's why we want to uh, go a step further and, and uh, gain uh, more information. And that's what we're doing by measuring PT differential flow, and in this case also uh, flow of identified particles, including different strange and multi-strange uh, particle species. And there are two uh, famous phenomena we can observe, and that is mass ordering here at the uh, low PT region, which is explained by a common boost from the medium. So basically all the particles get a kick from a medium, but the kick is felt 
weaker for the, for the heavier particles, and this can be very well described by hydrodynamics. And then in the intermediate PT region, so here, we are observing so-called baryon mass and grouping, and without any comparison to data, we already can clearly say from this, from this grouping that there is a partonic collectivity. But so you would trust me a little bit more, we of course have some uh, they, uh, model comparison as well, and that is a comparison with the, 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 this hybrid cold model and the combination of uh, hydrodynamics, quark coalescence and jet fragmentation, and hydrodynamics and jet fragmentation, but without any quark coalescence. So we want to study the contribution of the quark coalescence. And you can clearly see that the model with quark coalescence describes the data better, even though it's not perfect. But what is very interesting uh, is that uh, uh, the baryon mass and crossing, so the, this point, uh, basically, so between between the, the mass ordering and uh, baryon mass and grouping, uh, the, the crossing is not unique for the model with quark coalescence, which was believed that this actually explained by the quark coalescence, but it can be, it's also there without the coalescence itself. And in the beginning I said that I will be also talking about small systems, so for now I will stop uh, about uh, large systems. So uh, back in the day, small systems, when it came to um, flow measurements were also only believed to be to be some kind of a baseline because uh, there was no QGP and the flow uh, and hydrodynamics that was explained by uh, the presence of coagulant plasma. But at some point, a couple of years ago, there was this double ridge observed uh, first in uh, pilot collisions and then later on also in PP collisions. And this double ridge is a sign of collectivity. And afterwards, a sizable flow has been measured across all collision systems. Uh, so you can see the measurements here for, for uh, four different collision systems that are measured at the LAC. And this, together with multiparticle long-range correlations, confirm collectivity in small systems. But then there's the question that if uh, the flow is explained by coagulant plasma in heavy ion collisions, what is the origin of this collective effect in small systems? And while I will try to bring a little bit more insight, I will not, spoiler alert, I will not give you a big answer on this uh, very big question. Um, one of the reasons that is uh, making all the, all the work very complicated is the so-called so non-flow contamination. Uh, and uh, so basically all the small systems, so PP and PLET uh, in particular, are, are um, uh, contaminated by this non-flow, which are correlations associated with the common symmetry plane. Fortunately, we know how to fight non-flow, or we have several methods how to suppress it. Uh, so, for example, uh, pseudo-rapidity separation, so we are correlating particle from different uh, eta regions. Then we have higher order correlation, so we are correlating not only two particles, but three, four, and many. Uh, and then we can also subtract uh, non-flow using low multiplicity or peripheral collisions. We have several different methods, for example, peripheral subtraction where we're subtracting it explicitly, or template fit where we are assuming that the high multiplicity collision is a superposition of a scaled low multiplicity collision and some modulation, and an improved template fit, with a, with a, which is a further step, which is the template fit, but with the parametrization for the multiplicity dependence. But you can, as you can see here for the smaller uh, delta eta and here for larger delta eta, that the trend is the same for all, all methods. Uh, and uh, the physics conclusion are, are also similar. So I will just pick one of the methods for the final result. And the final results in the PP are shown here. So these originate from the, the ultra long range dihedron correlation. So ultra long range, you can see that using the forward detectors, we can go to the very, very long distances between two particles. And which is, might be surprising for some, uh, there are the same observation as in lead lead collision. So I put lead lead figure uh, here for comparison. And if you take a look at the uh, low PT region here, so we have, we can again see mass ordering there. And then if we go to intermediate PT region, so here, we can see very, very clear uh, baryon mass and splitting with actually more than three sigma. And as I uh, said with Ledlet, this already without any model comparison, just looking at the data, this is already very strong argument for partonic collectivity. But again, um, to, to uh, really claim that there is some partonic collectivity, uh, we compared our uh, data to different models, and again, the same as, as with Ledlet, we are comparing it with a comparison with hydrodynamics, co quark coalescence, and jet fragmentation, and no quark coalescence, and you can see that very clearly the model without quark coalescence, so this one, cannot describe trends seen in data. So uh, again, very strong argument that there is indeed partonic collectivity in, uh, in uh, pilot collisions. 
and to go to even a smaller system that is a PP, so the smallest collision system at the, at the LHC, we still have the same observation as in PLET and, uh, and LED-LED. So in, uh, in low PT region, the mass ordering, and, uh, and in the intermediate PT region, actually measured for the very first time in uh, PP collisions um, with more than three sigma. That's, that's uh, again, the, the bus um, variant mass and splitting. And uh, unfortunately, uh, for this, we can only claim the part on collective from data observation because right now there are no models that could describe PP results. So there is no uh, comparison uh, thank you. Uh, with and without quark coalescence. And that already brings me to my conclusion. So uh, anisotropic flow can be used uh, for studying initial conditions and transfer properties of coagulant plasma. And sizable flow has been measured across all collision systems, both large and small, with many similar observations. Uh, such as mass ordering that, that can be seen in all tree system and baryon meson splitting, which is typical for all of them are typical for lead lead, but baryon meson splitting has been observed right now for the first time with more than three sigma in both PP and PLET collisions, and this strongly suggests that there is a part in the collectivity in small systems. And these measurements provide new insights into the origin of collective effects in small collision systems, but uh, whether there is a droplet of QGP or not, that that uh, we cannot right now claim with uh, with any uh, confidence. Thank you. Thank you very much for this interesting talk. So the floor is open for discussion. Uh, thank you for a very nice talk, very clear talk. I have a um, question because uh, you saw very nice comparisons with um, model predictions, but in PILET, is it possible to see it also in PP? Yeah, we don't have uh, models in PP. Uh, okay, right so now. that's the reason. So okay, that's If my... there are some theory people in the room. <laughs> okay, more questions? So um, you were mentioning now at the end uh, the hypothesis of a QGP droplet uh, in PP, but uh, I mean, I do not understand how, why it's, uh, uh, let's say, the take uh, of these observations. I mean, protonic uh, coalescence means only that uh, partons are collimated and then they coalesce. Why does this need to be let's say, linked to, to a QGP, and it cannot be just simply that you have parton-parton scattering. New partons are created, they are collimating, and so be it. Because also you see that in PP, when you showed it together with PLED, at 13 TV, the flow is slightly larger. Well, if you look at Mason with respect to PLED, it seems to me that it's more like an energy-driven effect, right? Because you have 13 TV and not five. So maybe you can elaborate on that. Yeah. Um, so it's a fair point that it doesn't have to be a QGP droplet. That's just the, the first way of thinking that if in a heavy end collision, it's explained by by a presence of QGP or presence of something, then uh, if we see the same effect in PP and PLET, then whether it's possible that there would be something as well, but uh, we know that uh, jet quenching or other things that would uh, confirm this are of course not observed in, in small systems, so. Okay, any more questions? Um, I can see that the, there is a drop of V2 for, for high PT uh, values. Uh, could you explain uh, why is that? And is it related to, to non-flow effects? You mean in uh, uh, lead lead? Or because we don't in really lead. go too high, yes. high in, uh, in P lead and PP. Yeah, uh, so then, the, then um, actually there are even measurements going up to 20 or so. And you can see that then it's uh, becoming more or less flat for all the particle species. There are no, no uh, coalescent or no, no partonic collectivity. They're really, really just a uh, jet contribution. One brief question. So I remember at some point reading that the AMPT model now implemented some quark coalescence, and this can describe the delta eta, delta phi measurements by the release, apparently. Have you got any input on that, and can this be linked to the flow measurements that you're doing? Yes, so we are looking in the AMPT as well. Uh, I'm not really sure about small systems, but uh, with uh, flow effects with AMPT, you can only go up to 
3 GeV or so, you cannot go really higher because they're just hydrodynamics. So, uh, and, and we are actually interested in more in the intermediate PT, so the, the yeah. Okay, so I don't see more questions, so let's thank Susanna once again. And now we can move forward to Julia. Uh, Julia will speak about strangeness production, strangeness production <laughs> in the NA61 Shine experiment at the CERN SPS Energy Ranch. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, right. So good evening. Uh, today I will talk about, uh, as was already announced, about the strangeness production in the NA61 Shine experiment. And, and let me announce that this, it will be one of the very few talks on this conference which have nothing to do with hypernuclei and femtoscopy. So, uh, yeah, I'm very glad that you stayed after those words. Uh, uh, right, so uh, uh, let's start uh, with the, let me introduce you to the NA61 Shine experiment. Uh, it is a multi-purpose fixed target experiment uh, which is located on the H2 beam line of the CERN North Area which takes its beams from the SPS uh, accelerator, so the second largest accelerator at CERN. Uh, here on the right, you also can see the uh, layout of our detector. So uh, most importantly, we have a set of time projection chambers, two of which are uh, in the magnetic field, and also a set of uh, time of flight detectors. And uh, our experiment, uh, uh, very importantly, uh, can uh, can uh, operate uh, with two kinds of beams. The hadron beams at the moment range from 13 to 400 GV per C, and uh, also the ion beams uh, at the moment range from 13 to 150 GV per C per nucleon. Uh, so it allows naturally for a quite broad research program, uh, which includes the studies uh, of the properties of the onset of the confinement and fireball and uh, search for a critical point, if it is, exists. And uh, or recently, the measure, measurement of the open charm production. And additionally, we also do the uh, measurements of hadron production for neutrino programs at uh, Fermilab and uh, J-Park, and also the measurements uh, of the nuclear fragmentation cross-sections um, for uh, the interpretation of the results of uh, cosmic ray uh, physics experiments. Uh, so uh, obviously my today's talk will be more devoted to the studies of the properties of the onsets of the confinement and the fireball. And uh, uh, to, in order to do such a research, uh, the NA61 Shine performed a two-dimensional scan in collision energy in the system size, which can be seen here on the right. Uh, so, uh, naturally, one of the observables which we are interested in is the strangeness production, which uh, can be uh, measured through production of counts and lambdas. And uh, today I will be uh, mostly showing the count uh, spectra. Uh, so here are the, on the left are uh, transverse momentum spectra at mid rapidity at various energies. Uh, which are from the two, uh, 20 percent, the most central beryllium beryllium collisions. Then the PT spectra are uh, fitted with the exponential function, and uh, after the integration, we uh, get the, our rapidity spectra, which are on the right, uh, as well uh, at several energies. And then, in order to obtain the mean multiplicities of k pluses and k minuses. Uh, the measured points are summed, and then uh, uh, there is an extrapolation to the um, region where the acetam subdetector doesn't allow to measure, assuming uh, forward-backward uh, symmetry. Uh, so here are uh, the model comparisons. Uh, well, let me see if I can see anything here. Nice. Uh, so. Um, uh, right, so the PT spectra are uh, uh, well described by SMASH model and also, if I remember right, by your QMD in case of key pluses and the 
EPOS in case of key minuses, but overall uh, we can see that AMPT and PHSD tend to overestimate the data. And uh, in case of the rapidity spectra, both for K pluses and K minuses, uh, uh, the models overestimate our data except for SMASH, but uh, still SMASH doesn't have the right shape of the distribution. Uh, then we have uh, an in inverse slope parameter of the K plus and K minuses. So on the top, it is the uh, plotted as the function of rapidity together with the comparison with the EPOS model. And uh, it is obvious that EPOS underestimates our data. And uh, on the right, there is the uh, dependence on the collision energy. and. Uh, uh, here we can see that uh, K plus spectra are fairly good described by QMT and PHSD, but in case of K minuses, it's only a uh, good description by PHSD, while AMPT uh, grossly overestimates the data, and uh, uh, yeah, SMASH and EPOS are uh, a bit lower than it should be. Um, then uh, we have uh, the ratio of multiplicities of kaons and pions as well, and uh, on the left it is um, uh, the ratios of the positively charged kaons and pions uh, in uh, mid rapidity and uh, the four pi acceptance, and uh, on the right it is the four negatively charged kaons and pions. And uh, here we can see that. Uh, uh, the your QMD smash and depots have uh, quite uh, well a description of uh, our data while uh, the uh, PHSD and AMPT tend to overestimate the ratio though uh, in case of um, uh, negatively charged kaons and pions the, uh, the models are more clusterized uh, around the data and not how it is uh, for the positively uh, charged particles. Uh, so uh, additionally, I uh, want to show you the, uh, also the spectra in 10% uh, most central argon scandium collisions. So the analysis procedure is uh, quite similar for the one that I described before. And uh, it is a preliminary result and uh, uh, spoiler alert, the um, paper is in the preparation so uh, the model comparisons are to be seen uh, very soon. Uh, so we will see what we will have there. Uh, and now when going to the, compiling the uh, different results from the different collision energies and from different system sizes, uh, we are seeing some interesting uh, results, but their interpretation is the other question. So anyway, is the, here is the system size dependence of the inverse slope parameter. Um, in the, here it is uh, dependent on the collision energy. Uh, so uh, it was first observed in uh, heavy ion collisions, this uh, plateau structure, so so-called step. And uh, one of the interpretations is that uh, this is due to coexistence of hydrogen gas and quark gluon plasma uh, in the collision. Uh, and uh, but more interestingly, the uh, different uh, systems have uh, qualitatively same results, though the magnitude of the inverse slope parameter naturally increases with the system size. Uh, so here what we have. Uh, then we have uh, system size dependence of the uh, K to pi ratio in the mid rapidity and uh, in the four pi acceptance. So uh, as well uh, in heavy ion collisions uh, in NA49, I think uh, they observed this uh, maximum here at uh, around uh, seven, uh, 7 GV and uh, then uh, subsequent plateau. Uh, uh, so it was uh, interpreted as the signature of the occurring phase transition at the time. Uh, uh, right, but uh, for the uh, small systems such as proton proton and beryllium beryllium, here we do not have uh, any maximum, it's just a plateau structure. But what is more interesting that for recent argon scandium data here, we have uh, only uh, the plateau structure while the points are more close to the heavy systems data, but there is no maximum in there as well. 
And uh, finally, what I want to show you, this is the system size dependence of the K to pi uh, ratio and the temperature at uh, for, uh, 150 GV per C per nucleon. Uh, and what we see here is the increase of the observables while, uh, when going uh, from the small systems to uh, intermediate and large ones, which also uh, one of the interpretation is so-called onset of fireball, so the beginning of the clusterizing uh, of the strongly interacting matter. Uh, so here it is uh, uh, described as well, um, I mean, uh, compared as well with the dynamical and statistical models. And what is very interesting that, uh, so uh, let us see here, uh, in case of EPOS, your QMD and SMASH, which do not have the phase transition in them, uh, they have a good description of the data in uh, small systems such as proton-proton and beryllium-beryllium, but they overestimate the argon scandium and lead-lead data. And then the PHSD model, which has the phase transition, uh, nicely describes the, I mean, not, maybe not for the intermediate models, but uh, nicely describes the uh, data for large systems, but overestimates the data for small systems. And uh, in the case of the statistical models, both SMES, which uh, has the phase transition inside, and the HRG, which doesn't, uh, overestimate the data, obviously, especially in the case of the small systems. So uh, it brings me to my summary. Uh, so when A61 shine in order to perform the research that uh, we want to do, do uh, did the two-dimensional scan in uh, system size and the collision energy. Uh, it was uh, completed with the xenon lanthanum data in 2017. Uh, so various analyses are still ongoing in the old recorded data, as I can recall. Uh, obviously, because I didn't have much time here, I, for example, uh, didn't include the recent results on XI and XI-1530 in PP data. But if you're interested, ask me for a reference. And uh, um, so uh, as I showed, the present models cannot quite describe well the uh, data that uh, we obtain. And for example, this is a nice puzzling question. What's about this system size difference, with I, with, which I showed lightly. So uh, stay tuned for more results. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ilya, for a very interesting talk. And <coughs> we have time for a couple of questions. Can you uh, plan to extend this uh, study to, to strange variants? Yes, sure. So uh, actually my... And multi-strange. And multi-strange, <laughs> sure. I mean, if the statistics will allow us, obviously we will extend it to multi-strange. So uh, my PhD thesis is devoted to the lambdas in argon scandium and xenon lanthanum. So I think you are very much interested in these results. <laughs> and I will try to <laughs> obtain them. Uh, yes, but as I said, I also don't recall in your presentation the NA61 shine point for PP because we uh, published already the XI, uh, I think. There will be no uh, omega because I think it is uh, still uh, too, uh, don't, don't, we don't have enough statistics. But the lambda was already published, so you can uh, see the sigma, uh, or oh, I'm sorry, the XI to lambda ratio in uh, our PP. Okay, thank you. Okay, more questions? Yes, thank you for your nice talk. Uh, it seems that the, for the beryllium beryllium reaction, then uh, the uh, trend is somewhat different from others. And there may be because beryllium are deformed nuclei. How do you treat the defor nuclear deformation in uh, transport model calculations such as uh, MPT or SMASH or something like that? And uh, as you know, in the case of the uranium target and the uh, Uranium uranium collision was uh, performed at uh, SPS before? No? Alice? The beryllium beryllium, mm. I think, was not measured before. 
if I rightly understood the question, uh, so it is the first beryllium. The, uh, beryllium nuclear deformation is very strong for beryllium. Yes. And uh, therefore, uh, why uh, then uh, there are a lot of complications may appear. Yeah, okay, I see what you Then mean. Uh, I think that it's better to use carbon-carbon, uh, which mm -hmm. is uh, relatively So let me refer you to the uh, article which was cited in there. It is 40 pages, I think. There is something written on that point there. Hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. More questions to Yulia? Okay, so I, if there's no more questions, let's thank Julia once more. And now we can move forward. Our next speaker is Gorgius Mansaratis with strong interaction studies in Lambda Hadron system up to S minus three with Alice. Yes, let's wait okay. for your slides. Yeah. Please go ahead. Okay. Um, hello and good e uh, afternoon. Uh, my name is Gergis Mazaridis, and I'm going to show you um, our um, results on the uh, measurement of the baryon baryon interaction um, of systems involving the lambda uh, hadron. And um, we measured the, the, the least experiment. And to start, which button do I have to use? Ah, okay. Uh, to start things off and uh, motivate them, um, I want to remind you of the um, misalignment that is present in, uh, in, the, in, in the field of uh, baryon baryon interactions when strangeness is involved. So, on the one hand, we have um, classical uh, experiments such as uh, scattering experiments, scattering experiments, uh, which are um, which, uh, with which we can uh, constrain very well the nuclear nuclear interaction. And we can go even uh, further to stranger minus one, and with um, and with hypernuclear experiments, we can go even further to stranger minus two. But going beyond that, it's um, really difficult because of the small lifetimes of the involved particles. Um, and along with that goes uh, go the um, large uh, the growing uncertainties in uh, theoretical calculations such as chiral effective field theory, uh, where the free parameters have to be fixed by um, the experimental data. And on the other hand, we have um, lattice QCD calculations, which are the uh, first principle calculations of the um, strong interaction, which are um, where the signal to noise um, ratio is um, better, the heavier the quark masses are that are involved. So um, if we want to test and verify um, these first principle um, lattice QCD calculations, we somehow have to reach into the higher strangeness sectors. And uh, by the end of the talk, I hope that I have convinced you that with uh, femtoscopy, we can exactly uh, do that. And in particular, we are going, I'm going to focus on the lambda-lambda interaction in the strangeness minus two system, and lambda-xi, and coupled to this, the uh, proton-omega interaction. We already had um, a very nice introduction, introduction by Dimita and uh, Laura, and also Bavani, on the femtoscopy method, so I'm going to summarize the most important things. Um, the central part of femtoscopy is the two-particle correlation function, which is defined in terms of the relative momentum k star of the two particles we want to measure in, the, in their pair rest frame. And theoretically, we can um, be calculated uh, with two ingredients. So first is the source function, which is the, which is the probability distribution for the two particles that we want to study to be emitted at the relative distance r star from each other. And uh, the second ingredient, ingredient is the two-particle wave function, which contains the interaction potential we want to measure. And um, as Dimitar explained al already to you, we have a way to constrain the source function. So for, the, for this talk, we are going to focus only on the interaction, which is contained in the wave function. And in the um, sketch here, you can see how a repulsive interaction corresponds to a correlation function, which is below one, an attractive interaction to a correlation function, which, which is above one, and if the interaction is strong enough to facilitate a bound state, then we can see it in the depletion uh, here, where the correlation function goes below one. This will be important um, later, so keep this, this in mind. Okay, um, with uh, that we can already start looking at some interactions, and we will start with the lambda-lambda interaction. 
um, which is very interesting to study, also because of the lambda-lambda bound state that has been predicted, but never found in any direct production experiments. The best constraint on the binding energy of the two uh, lambda um, hadrons uh, was given by, is given by double lambda hypernuclear experiments, um, in particular the Nagara event, where one can um, calculate out of the binding energy an upper limit to the binding energy of the two lambdas. And this upper limit has been found to be around 7 MeV, which is quite large. Now let's try to see how we can improve the thermoscopy on that. And for that, I bring you the experimental correlation function of the lambda lambda measured in proton proton collisions at 13 um, tera electron volt uh, collision energy. Actually, this analysis is a combined measurement of uh, run one data at 7 TeV and proton lead collisions. And um, what you can see here, uh, you have to pay attention because the um, dotted line um, indicated with quantum statistics um, uh, is now a new reference uh, line because uh, this is not the genuine correlation function. It contains also uh, contributions from misidentified particles of feed-on contributions so, and also the Fermi statistics because we have two identical particles. So our reference frame, uh, our reference is not the unity line, but it's this dotted line. So above the dotted line means um, attraction, below um, repulsion. And what you can see already by eye very well is that uh, those two models up there are incompatible with our data and those models predict a either a very strongly attractive interaction or a shallow bound state, whereas we are in uh, a good agreement with models predicting a, a shallow attractive interaction or a normal bound state. And now we want to quantify this a bit better, so we turn to the effective range expansion where we get the scattering parameters, um, D0, which is the effective range, and F0, which is the um, scattering length. And in our convention, a positive scattering length corresponds to an attractive interaction and a negative scattering length to a repulsive interaction or to a bound state if the effective range has the uh, correct value. And what we now can do is with the lednitsky guboschitz model, which is an, a, a model where we can calculate the correlation function analytically, um, we can scan the whole parameter space of D0 and um, F0. Just be careful that this time F0 is the inverse. And uh, we can calculate analytically the correlation function compared to our data and express the compatibility in terms of n sigma. Um, and what we see is that we have two um, regions of um, good agreement. The large uh, white one um, in, the, in the top, which uh, is compatible with where the scattering, scattering parameters indicate a shallow attractive interaction. And what is very nice to see is that we are compatible with uh, the uh, predictions from lattice QCB, which is the big um, data point you see there. There. Um, and also with um, the two models um, th uh, which are indicated by a star, which um, are um, anchored to hypernuclear experiments. So they reproduce the data from hypernuclear experiments and we are compatible also with them. Now what about the bound state? If you look carefully, um, down there, um, there's also a region, a white region, which um, leaves room for the bound state. And from the scattering parameters, we can calculate the, a new upper limit for the binding energy. Um, the best agreement uh, in terms of n sigma comes for binding energy with, um, at uh, about 3 MeV. Okay, uh, so this is already very good. We can move on um, by increasing our strangeness content by one. Uh, that brings us to the lambda xi uh, interaction. And um, how was the situation before femtoscopy? Well, the slide is empty, not because I was lazy to, too lazy to create one, but because this interaction has never been measured before. So um, it is, but it is an interesting um, interaction to measure because uh, not only for the interaction itself, but also for the implication it has for uh, the proton omega interaction, which we also measured uh, two years ago and published um, in Nature. And in order to understand the connection between those two, I'm going to summarize the most important things. So the proton omega system can couple either to a spin one or spin two state. And from the whole QCD collaboration, we were provided with the lattice QCD potentials for the spin two state. Um, there's no problem in calculating that. You see the potential here. Um, it gets more complicated for the spin one channel because in uh, principle, there could be um, a coupling to um, lambda xi or sigma xi, which have the same quantum numbers. But this um, coupling is not considered in the calculation, so it's not known how um, large it contributes. What we can do is we can discuss two limiting cases. We can say either that um, 
the contributions are negligible, so it follows the same form as the uh, spin 2 channel, or that the inelastic contributions are dominant. Okay, with that in mind, let's look at the protonomic correlation function. Um, the first thing we notice is uh, that if we consider only Coulomb interaction, which is this orange line here, then um, we see that we are incompatible with our data. We are missing um, a huge part of the attractiveness. You see the correlation function goes up uh, until six, um, and I have to say here this is the genuine correlation function, so all experimental effects are uh, out, and we can directly compare to theory. Um, this is a very strong signal, and we are incompatible with the Coulomb only uh, uh, um, assumption. So we really are sensitive to the strong interaction, and because of that, our best agreement comes with the most attractive inter uh, interaction predicted by the whole QC collaboration, um, which is um, the um, assumption that there's no coupling to sigma xi or lambda xi. Still, there's some tension between theory and model, uh, theory and our uh, correlation function or measurement, because the theory predicts a bound state of around 2.5 MeV. Uh, remember the depletion I told you in the beginning? You see it very nicely in both um, calculations actually, but our data does not uh, reproduce that. Um, so we have to, um, what we can do is we can go either to um, larger colliding systems or try to understand this strangeness minus two sector better. And this, this brings us to the lambda xi interaction, which is a very uh, fr freshly measured uh, in, um, interaction. We um, uploaded the paper a few weeks ago on archive and it, it, it got accepted on PLB, so you can read the paper soon. Um, well, we compared here the um, correlation function to the, uh, again to the baseline, which um, has the assumption that there's no interaction, and you see that we are perfectly compatible with it. So uh, the strong interaction in the lambda size system seems to be r really shallow. Um, yes. Um, of course, we want to compare it also to lattice QCD calculations, and for that, um, the whole QCD collaboration provided us again with the potentials. This time, the coupling to sigma xi, so from lambda xi to sigma xi, um, is included in the calculations. <laughs> and what we do is we um, discuss again two cases. So, with the coupling um, considered, this is the orange curve, and the red one is um, without coupling. And you see that this coupling plays a sizable role in the interaction. However, with our um, st uh, statistics, we are not yet sens uh, sensitive to the difference. Um, uh, but still, the red curve is um, more compatible with our data, but not, no real sensitivity. Um, I want to highlight the, uh, what we can say about the coupling to proton omega, because we expect the uh, channel opening at around 460 MeV. Um, but, and even if we are tempted to, to, to see this cusp, uh, statistically, it's uh, unfortunately not relevant. So um, this is... Uh, but on the other hand, this is um, compatible with, with what we saw in Proton Omega. Remember that there, the best the, uh, assumption that fits our data best is the one that neglects the coupling. So we are consistent. Okay, uh, as a last point, I want to um, uh, compare also to calculations for, from chi effective field theory to leading order. Um, we have actually two uh, versions of this uh, calculations available, the NLO16 and NLO19 potential um, at two different cutoffs. And um, we can see here that both of them have a rather large uh, cutoff dependence, especially the NLO19 potential, um, which predicts in the triplet state a strong attraction, which is incompatible with our data. And uh, this, sh this uh, shows you that uh, we can also, for these calculations, provide um, important constraints uh, for the theorists. Okay, as a summary, um, I think the most important thing that you have to remember is uh, or to take home is that we uh, really can um, do comparisons with the lattice QCD calculations uh, with our data. We can do that in the lambda-lambda interaction, in the proton omega, and lambda xi. And with the upcoming run three and run four um, data that we're going to take at the LHC, we can do even more. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for a very good talk, and we have time for questions. Comments? Um, I have a question on the uh, shape of the pi omega uh, potential that, that you got from HAL QCD co collaboration. Um, I think 
previous slide uh, on the on the potential. Ah. Oh, this one. Uh, so I understand that the shape of the potential is related uh, due to exchange of different types uh, of mesons. Uh, but can you tell me a bit more about the, the shape? Uh, so is it one over R or uh, how the so how can you de describe the shape in each of the uh, regions? Um, as far as I remember, maybe correct me. Um, mm -hmm. It's um, uh, you cover type potential with a. Um, together with a um, exponential Gaussian exponential so it's um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, so we got a recipe from the whole QCD collaboration how to fit the data and as far as I remember it was uh, a typical Yukawa potential with some exponentials does it answer your question yes yes I think so so um, so you just use different uh, different formula in different uh, range of R, right? To, uh, to fit the potential. Yeah, so it is uh, definitely, mm -hmm. it's consistent because um, yes, yes. the whole QCD mm -hmm. people um, give, give us the potential and told us how to fit it, so it's... Um, mm -hmm. Okay, good, thank you. Okay, more questions? So can you go to lambda xi correlation? Yeah, probably I missed, but could you explain again what the baseline is here? Uh, okay, yes, so um, this is not a genuine correlation function, which, um, so if you calculate it by the formula in the beginning that I showed you, where you take the source function and the um, interaction, then you get a correlation function. So this contains also other effects. We have, for example, and this is actually, um, was one of the uh, big challenges in this analysis, um, to account correctly for the feed-down contributions, where um, we don't have, um, so we measure lambda xi, right? But the lambda does not only occur as a primordial particle emitted from the source, but it's also a decay product from the xi. And it's not only a decay product from the xi, but also from omega and, uh, and so on. So you have to filter them out. And um, so you can basically either filter them out and extract the genuine correlation function or correct your theoretical calculations for the contributions, if you know them, and this is what we did. And um, this baseline incorporates uh, all this. Okay, so is it estimated by, based on this simulation, or? So, so is it estimated based on the simulation, or kind um, of the data-driven way, or? Yes, and also for the, so for the feed-down from, uh, from XI, we um, calculate with the Coulomb so we assume Coulomb interaction only because also it gets washed out when it, we transform them to the lambda xi system. Yeah. Okay. I don't see more questions, so let's... Ah, and of course, uh, energy conservation effects for... So basically, the, uh, uh, the baseline is fitted in the... <laughs> that's the most important thing. Uh, in the large K star region where we have um, correlations due to um, energy conservation and momentum conservation, and there we fit the baseline, but let it um, constrain it on large K star. So, yeah, so to describe this long large K star effects. Yeah, so this feed-down correction is really important because the feed-down particles really contaminate your correlation function. Okay, so I don't see more questions, so let's thank our speaker again. <laughs> and next we have uh, Manami Nagakawa with unique approach for precise determination of binding energies of hyper the Triton and under hypernuclei and nuclear emulsion, emulsion and motion learning. Oh, thank you for the Please go ahead. So I am Manami Nakaga from Riken, and this is uh, the, our collaboration. I am going to talk about uh, from uh, from introduction and uh, nuclear emulsion and machine learning. And then ongoing search and uh, the current development. So many of uh, most, most of you know the hypertriton puzzle, but uh, just uh, please let me summarize uh, briefly. So hypertriton is the simplest hypernuclear system and benchmark in hypernuclear physics. The, however, uh, recent results show the lifetime is uh, that can differ from conventional interpretation and uh, in addition the binding energy also is in a similar uh, situation therefore from our group 
the Hiroyuki Ekawa will talk af right after my talk. And uh, from my side, uh, so for the precise binding energy measurement, we use uh, the new data of nuclear emulsion and uh, our s state of the art technology. So the So this is uh, the real emulsion picture of the JPAC E07 experiment, which is to search for double hypernuclei. Just af right after experiment, we analyzed the, the event with tagging K minus K plus reaction, and uh, then the, the tag of the Xi minus production. Then we followed this track, then uh, we measured uh, the uh, 30, about 70 events observed. So, but however, non-triggered events in, in that event still there is expected to be thousands of double hypernuclei and millions of single hypernuclei. So, to detect all of them, we do we are doing the overall scanning. So, this is microscope system. And the next one is uh, the realistic, uh, real microscopic view. But when we measure, we take uh, the all of uh, emulsion, E07 emulsion sheet, uh, 1,300 sheets. So it, that uh, the size of the data will be huge amount. Then when we do the eye in, uh, visual inspection by human eyes, it will take uh, more than 500 years. So uh, therefore, we use the, we perform machine learning. So now, currently, we are aiming at uh, the detect, uh, detect, to detect uh, the two-body decay of uh, hypertriton, at least decay. Uh. And in, uh, in uh, nuclear emulsion, the, this event should appear like this, the left, right figure. But the detection looks the suitable for machine learning, but there is no training data. So therefore, we need to create simulated image from physics simulation. So from uh, here, I would like to explain about uh, the procedure of production of the simulated image. So first, now we have a training a real image from microscope view. So then, uh, and then this can, this is converted to, to the line image by binarization. That's uh, the, this color shows the depth information. So we chose the machine uh, gun technique, and the, the machine learning, the, that the model should learn the, this pair of the question and the answer. Then now we have uh, the training, trained model. So next is uh, the input data. So uh, this is uh, just an uh, example of uh, the event which we made, we made uh, simulated uh, the image. So this is alpha decay as uh, the positive sample, and the next is uh, the beam interaction as negative sample. The third one is real, this is real event, real image, but it converted from the real image. So then after that, the, the, we mix them. So now we have an input image and the trained model. Then we, after we apply the trained model uh, to this uh, input data, then we got a simulated image like this. So now we established this method to uh, produce simulated image. So then just we make the, we do the simulation again for hypertriton. Then we, now we have the hypertriton, simulated hypertriton image. Okay. The next step is the event detection. We chose the Maskell CNN model as object detection. Now to learn this uh, 
the, to train this model, we need the pay, uh, pair of image and the mask image. For our case, we are aiming at this event. Now we uh, simulated, uh, we have a simulated image and the mask image. So then this model run this pair of simulated image and the mask image. Then now we have trained the model. So finally, we, after we applied this trained model to real overall scanning data. So this is uh, the result. So maybe the, at the, the being, uh, yesterday, the, the already we saw the, this result, but I will quickly explain. So from here, Kion is coming at uh, interact uh, in nucleus in nuclear emulsion. Then the several fragments are emitted, and one of them is hyper triton. Now this flight for a while at the, at some point that uh, stopped at rest, then two body decay. This side is helium-3, the other side is pion. Then we followed this uh, track and finally stopped uh, with this range. Then finally we identified uh, this event is a hypertriton. So currently we observed uh, 35 events for hypertriton. So, oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, and uh, <coughs> around 80 events for hydrogen 4 lambda with uh, stop by on stop the event. So when we reached 400 events, so the <coughs> those both of statistics error and the systematic error will be 30 kV. So this result and uh, the this result is, will be the <coughs> PhD thesis of Ayumi Kasagi from Gifu University and Riken. So this is the current situation of hypertriton search. So from now, I would like to the, talk about uh, the current development and further development. Now we have uh, the, we established this method to me measure, uh, to detect the hypernuclear event. So the one is the single hypernuclear search. So many hypernuclear hyper decay with many body decays. The currently we are aiming at the three body decay. So because especially these three are important. So at least the hypertriton and the hydrogen four lambda can be compared with the two body decay result. And uh, for helium four lambda case, so so far there is a uh, high ground state of helium four lambda has not uh, been uh, has been observed uh, measured by only all the emulsion. So now we are developing this uh, three body decay. This is I would like to show the current st status. So this is a simulated image of the three body decay. So from here, hypertriton is coming at the stop of the three body decay. So this development will be the master thesis of Shohei Sugimoto from Saitama University and Riken. So <coughs> the other one is double hypernuclear search. Uh, it is important point is that uh, we can measure and observe new double hypernuclear and increase statistics of non double hypernuclear. So the, this is the Nagara event. The, the, this event uh, shows that Xi minus is captured uh, by carbon 12 and decay into the three body decay with the helium 6 double lambda. And this uh, High double hypernucleus uh, also decay to the single, single hypernucleus. For current development, for humans, uh, because it is easy to see that we choose the 
、all particles are charged particles. So this is、uh, this、uh, from top, the xi minus is coming at、uh, captured by carbon 12, then decay into three body, and、uh, this double hypernucleus decay into three body, and、uh, like this. And、uh, this result will be the PhD thesis of Yang He from Rancho University, and we can. So then, this is the current、uh, our development. The fi finally, we want to measure the all hypernuclear events in our nuclear emulsion. So this is the summary.、So、for binding energy of hypernuclear, the, the precise measurement is needed. So the, therefore, we choose the nuclear emulsion and the machine learning. So now we are, our go, ongoing research is the two body decay of hyper triton and hydrogen four lambda. And then we are, we are developing also for single hyper nuclear search and double hyper nuclear search. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Manami, for a very nice talk. We have time for a few questions. Yeah, thank you for your talk.、Um, one thing which I did not fully get, maybe you can elaborate on that,、uh, is how can you identify which hypernuclei you produced? You said you do this somehow with the pion momentum. Yeah,、oh, exactly yes, on this、uh, slide. Hydrogen 4 case, the, this range should be around 42 or 3 millimeter.、Mm -hmm. So, on the, in the two body decay, basically the only two hyper triton and the hydrogen 4 lambda only decay in the two body decay. So, then we can easily identify. Yeah, but、uh, how can you distinguish between whether it was hyper hydrogen 4 or hyper triton?、Uh, this, only this range. This、uh, pion range. Yeah. Okay, by the distance. Ah,、uh, yes, only this、uh, length. Yeah.、Uh, this, this, yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, more questions? I would like to ask you about、uh, this machine learning because you mentioned that you use machine learning techniques. Could you please say something more about how to apply this algorithm? Which、um, one? <laughs> so, for example, I, I don't know which is the better. What kind of network you use, and something more about algorithm、so、you use in your data analysis? So, <laughs> not so many things. So, basically, after, of course,、uh, currently we use this model to detect、uh, and to reduce human load. But、uh, still, this、uh, model can reduce,、uh, let's say, the, to the, the 1% of、uh, whole data. So then, next,、uh, still,、uh, I didn't explain about other, another <coughs> technique, but we use the also C, only,、uh, CNN filter. We also developed.、Uh, After that filter, we got、uh, again we can decrease number of image and、uh, to uh, and reduce the human load, human workload. And finally, with this、uh, the this measure this measurement of this length this range is、uh, it takes a very long time. Okay, many thanks. So. If we don't have more questions, let's thank our speaker again. And now, and now we'll have presentation given by、uh, Hiroyuki Kappa.
With VASA FRS Hype High Experiment at GSI for studying light hypernuclei. Yeah, ready. Please go ahead. Okay. So first of all, I'd like to thank the all organizers for giving me a good opportunity to, rep to talk in this conference. So I'm Hiroki Ekawa from uh, High Energy Nuclear Physics Laboratory, Riken in Japan. Today I'd like to report about uh, our uh, activity of the what's the FRA's Hi-Fi experiment at GSI, which aims to study the right hypernuclei. So hypernuclei is an important subject to investigate the volume volume interaction. And in order to produce hypernuclei, uh, historically, uh, secondary meson beams, such as pion or kaons, or uh, primary electron beams are mainly used. But as other ways, so we can use uh, heavy ion beams to produce hypernuclei. With such idea, high five phase zero experiment was read out in the 2009. And in this experiment, uh, two AGB rhythm six beam uh, was injected in the fixed rhythm, uh, no, no, carbon 12 target. And this projectile energy is higher than the threshold to make uh, uh, around the hyperon. So, so around the hyperon can be emitted from this hot participant zone. Then, uh, by capturing this lambda, projectile fragment can become hypernuclei. And this hypernuclei can decay into two body by emitting a pion, uh, by emitting pions. So, uh, by detecting the, this pion and the decay residue, uh, we can construct the invariant mass. Then from this invariant mass spectrum, we can identify uh, whether this hypernuclei, uh, hypernuclei was produced or not. So this experiment shows the utility of this method and uh, revealed two major puzzles. So one of the puzzles is the uh, uh, you know, indication of the NN lambda. These two histograms show the uh, invariant mass of deuterium and pi minus, and these two histograms show the uh, invariant mass of the tritium and the pion. Here you can see the bump structure on the background, and this indicates the possible NN round bound state. But uh, this distribution is broad, and uh, uh, such bound state is hardly produced by the theoretical calculations, so this existence of NN round is still unknown. And another puzzle is the short lifetime of hypertriton. Uh, as discussed by the previous speaker, Manami Nakagawa, uh, hypertriton binding energy is small. This value is 0.13 MeV, which is measured in the old uh, emergent experiment. Now, this is the question number, but uh, anyway, so <laughs> uh, according to the, this uh, small binding energy, so hypertriton is considered as a loosely bound state between the deuteron and the lambda. So uh, its lifetime is also considered as uh, almost the same as the free lambda. But the uh, uh, result of the uh, high experiment, uh, phase zero experiment, uh, this shows the shorter lifetime. It was uh, 183 picoseconds. <laughs> and then other uh, heavy iron experiment, so Alice and Star also shows its value. And especially this star value is uh, uh, obtained by the fixed target uh, experiment. This plot is uh, submitted in the, uh, by the star collaboration recently, and uh, it summarizes the recent value uh, of the lifetime of hypertriton. And as a, as a average, this value is uh, considerably smaller than the free lambda. So uh, this is against our knowledge, and this value is also changing depending on the statistics, so we need a more precise measurement now. <laughs> Therefore, we have planned and carried out the WASA FRS Hi-Fi experiment. <laughs> this experiment was carried out as a campaign of the uh, uh, WASA FRS experiment together with the eight prime Masonic nuclei experiment. <laughs> Uh, this experiment was carried out at the uh, FRS at GSI with water detectors. Here, this drawing is the uh, beam line of GSI, and uh, heavy iron beam accelerated in the synchrotron is injected in the, into the FRS. <laughs> and uh, the isotopes, which have specific uh, <coughs> rigidity, are delivered into the each Focal plane depends on their uh, magnetic setting. <laughs> and the water is a wide angle shower apparatus which was used at the Koji Urich. <laughs> and this water consists of the superconducting surround magnet 
and rated detectors. In our experiment, we aim to detect the hypertriton, hydrogen for lambda, and in lambda. And these hypernuclei are produced at the S2 focal plane uh, uh, of the, by using the collision of the beam and target. And uh, this decay residue is de identified by the latter half of uh, FRS with good momentum resolution, which is uh, 10 to the minus fourth in the delta P over P. And thanks to this uh, good separation uh, performance of FRS, we can make very clear trigger for data taking. And the pion is uh, detected by the water detector uh, with wide, uh, wide acceptance. So this experiment is completely different from the ordinary FRS experiment, so it was very challenging. And in this experiment, we use the lithium-6 and the carbon-12 beam with 1.96 AGB, and our target is the diamond with a mass thickness of 9.87 gram per centimeter square. This is a setup of water detectors. And this water solenoid is located at the center, surrounded by the cesium iodide calorie beta. And these CSIs are attached on the uh, ion yolks. And during the experiment, this yolk was closed. And the magnetic field at the center of what solenoid was uh, one tesla meter, uh, one tesla in our experiment. And a uh, mini to chamber to, start, uh, to measure the uh, momentum of charged particle inside of solenoid and uh, plastic scintillators to, for the TOF measurement are located inside of the what solenoid. And these plastic scintillator have a uh, barrel and uh, end cap shape to surround the MDC. And uh, outside of solenoid, we installed the fiber trackers to detect, uh, to detect the incoming and outgoing particles. And among them, one of the detectors is located in the was, uh, was York, iron yolk, and this is so-called mini fiber tracker. And uh, for this, in this experiment, most of the detectors are newly developed by ourselves. And finally, these detectors are constructed at the S2 focal plane, like this. And this beautiful photo was taken by the photographer, Yang Hosan, together with the GSI fair. And in order to estimate the performance of our detector system, uh, we have performed the Monte Carlo simulation. In this simulation, uh, we implemented our detector as shown in the last uh, page and uh, we inputted the realistic detector resolution, which is taken in the test measurement. And uh, uh, detector, uh, no, no, no. particle distribution is obtained by the uh, transport model, WQMD, with the assumption of the coalescence factor to produce hypernuclei uh, and the ordinary nuclei. And this histogram shows the expected spectrum of the invariant mass of the uh, Helium-3 and Pion. And this, uh, this red region corresponds to the uh, hypertriton decay event, and the blue region came from their background. And this statistics correspond to the four days measurement, and from here, uh, hypertriton count is 5,800, uh, and the peak width is 3.2 MeV in humor. So as a result, so we estimate the lifetime accuracy in terms of statistics error. This is uh, eight picosecond. And these values are very much improved from the high five phase zero experiment. And additionally, we have developed the track finding analysis with the graph neural networks, so-called GNN, uh, depend on the, this Monte Carlo simulation, uh, based on the, this Monte Carlo simulation data. And uh, this GNN can treat the graph data structure, which can show the data nodes and, each, and their relation. So, uh, so by uh, using the, uh, uh, thanks to these features, by using the machine learning technique, so the data heat can be clusterized by running the correct heat connection, which means in which the, this Digital heat belongs to the same track. And this is a, oh, sorry, sorry. 
This is an example of the, this, this node clustering. Each node shows the detector heat in each detector layer, and this different colors show the different tracks. <laughs> and we have uh, confirmed more than 98% of pion tracks are found with this GNN model. Uh, this result will be published very soon, and yeah, now this is the final, final phase to submit. And our data taking was carried out in this January to March, and our leave time was uh, separated into three sections. Three sections. The first, we have performed the commissioning run for the, our directors, and uh, we have performed the physics run for the eight prime uh, Mesonic nuclear experiment. Then, physics run for, uh, for the hyper experiment was carried out. Uh, in total, we accumulated uh, roughly 100 terabyte data. And the acquired fragment in high fi experiment is like this. In the recent VM setting, we took the oh, <laughs> three different types of uh, setting. So first, this helium-3 is for the hyper triton, and this helium-4 and the deuteron is for the hydrogen-4 lambda and NN lambda. Since these two uh, fragments have the same a over Z, this means same rigidity, so we can get this data simultaneously in the same setting. And we originally we took the proton with rapidity data also to detect the lambda uh, decay event as a calibration. And additionally, moreover, uh, we took the carbon-12 beam data also. This is the first feasibility study <laughs> for the uh, proton-rich hypernuclei such as the uh, boron-9 lambda in the future high fi experiment. In this beam setting, we did the helium-3 and the carbon-9. <laughs> so uh, now we are analyzing these two data, but uh, still, uh, since we took this data very, very recently, so still now we are analyzing the very basic features such as data is healthy or uh, some parameter tuning was so on, so uh, we cannot show good plot uh, today, but we can show some premier results. Here, uh, we have a plastic scintillator in the S2 focal, S3 focal plane and S4 focal plane. So by using, uh, by checking the time of flight between these and the energy deposit, we can identify the fragment uh, of the S2. So these plots show the correlation between the uh, time of flight and the uh, energy deposit at S4. So this left one is the helium-3 setting, and the right one is the helium-4 and the D setting in recent beam. So we can clearly see the helium-3 and the D and the helium-4. So this FRS PID is function is working well. <laughs> and in the analysis of WASA, uh, still we are tuning the position parameter of the tracking detectors. So the tracking with the fiber and MDC is not yet done, but the fiber tracking is working well. This distribution is the uh, vertex distribution uh, by the, the fiber trucks to reconstruct the primary vertex on the target. And here we can see this uh, P equal uh, bump, and this VC is similar to the target side. This means this vertex uh, reconstruction is working, uh, also the, this uh, under the parameter tuning. <laughs> and we take the correlation between the fiber Truck and MDC the position in the phi angle. And here you can see the clear correlation. So this means the uh, director itself is working well. So uh, tracking will be done soon, very soon. <laughs> so let me summarize. What's the FRS hyper experiment aimed to study like hypernuclei? So we will measure the lifetime of the hyper triton and uh, hydrogen 4 lambda, and we will check whether any lambda exists or not. And data taking was successfully done, and the analysis is ongoing. So this is our collaboration. Thank you for all. So thank you very much for interesting talk. We have time for a short question. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your nice talk, but uh, I may not understand very well about uh, data uh, data taking conditions. So can you go back to the page to summarize the data taking? So yeah, yeah, okay. Ho, uh, yeah, this one. Okay. So okay. for the NN lambda, so I think the the main 
channel should be the tried on by miners, right? But uh, uh, in the case of this, so oh, <laughs> you, it seems that you want to measure the p d pi mi d pi minus d plus neutron. So it means, but uh, you need the invariant mass spectroscopy. So then, okay. So uh, how the reason why we didn't do Triton is like this. So first of all, we use the two GeV beam, and this is almost the maximum rigidity in our FRS. And since uh, because of this structure, this projectile uh, rigidity is almost same as the uh, projectile. And we are using the receive uh, six beam, and this D is also so A over D is the same. Oh. So D is also maximum we can get with this reaction. So tritium is, uh, in order to detect the tritium with this with the beam energy, we need more higher magnetic field. So tritium is impossible. And in the old Wasa experiment, uh, even in the uh, D, oh, maybe, D plus pi invariant mass, we can see the bump structure. This means we are considering it's there are one more step before the, this uh, D plus pi. This means the first is an enough the decay into the tritium star and the pi minus. And this tritium star decay into two bodies. Then uh, even we uh, reconstruct the invariant mass by the D plus pi, we can see some bump. So, but finally, uh, anyway, so you need to measure the neutron, no? Neutron. Uh, new, neutron. Uh, but, so, so in this is, uh, okay, in this state, so neutron, what, we can, counter? what we can say is that we can confirm, really, we can get, I say, we can see this bump or not. So even we cannot see the bump structure, we cannot exclude any rounders because we can decay into the triton and the pion. So in this case, you are right. <laughs> Maybe it's better to discuss it. <laughs> okay, I, I think we, we should move forward. So let's thank our speaker once again. Well, thank you. And the next speaker uh, will be Falk Schupp with Probing Neutron Skin uh, in Krypton and Xenon Isotopes by Exclusive Anti Lambda Lambda and Anti Lambda. Uh, say production with antiprotons. Okay, please go ahead. Okay, thank you for the introduction. And uh, my name is Falk Schub, and uh, my talk is also a bit special because I'm not, we're not exactly st studying the hyperon itself, but using it as a tool to measure the neutron skin. And as a short introduction, uh, the neutron skin, neutron-rich nuclei are, expect, are expected to have a neutron skin, which is defined as the difference in the RMS radius of the neutron and proton density distribution. And this is correlated with the neutron nuclear symmetry energy, which is the energy cost associated with adding an additional neutron and proton asymmetry in a nuclei. We can define a slope of this symmetry energy L which quantifies the dis difference between the symmetry energy in the saturation density region in the nuclear core versus the low density region on the surface. This slope is also an important parameter in the equation of state of neutron-rich systems. And if you look at the right side, we can see the neutron skin of lead 208 versus the slope for several different mean field models. And we can see that there is a linear correlation between neutron skin and the slope. Therefore, by measuring the neutron skin, we get uh, insight into the symmetry, uh, symmetry energy parameter. So far, many different approaches have been used to determine this neutron skin, for example, using hadronic probes. However, these are expected to have large systematic errors due to the difficulty of extracting the neutron skin from the hadronic reaction, which is model dependent. The same holds true for electromagnetic probes. So in recent, most recent experiments use the weak interaction, and by measuring the parity violating asymmetry, uh, we can, with the least model dependence, determine the neutron skin. But the problem with this experiment, the problem is that the effect is on the order of one part per million. So it, is, uh, it requires extremely high statistics and is a very technically challenging measurement. 
Also, there are, of course, ob astrophysical observation of neutron stars, which give us some limit on the parameters in the equation of state, and therefore indirectly on the neutron skin thickness. Uh, we at Pandar are located at FAIR in Darmstadt, Germany, which is, a con which is currently under construction. You can see here the plant facility, construction site, some buildings are already completed. And when it's finished, we will have an antiproton accelerator, and we propose a new approach using the antiprotons in an exclusive annihilation in nuclei. As I mentioned, we are using the hyper the tool for measurement here, and the advantage of using antiprotons is a strong observation due to annihilation, which gives us a high sensitivity to the nuclear periphery and therefore the neutron skin. When an antiproton traverses the, nu the nuclei, it has a very short absorption length in the order of one femtometer but at, nuclear, at normal nuclear matter density, which is in the same order as a neutron skin thickness of some isotopes. Therefore, there's a high probability that an antiproton will annihilate inside the neutron, neutron skin before it can actually reach the proton distribution. And by simultaneously measuring the exclusive pair production close to the uh, production threshold of lambda bar sigma minus and lambda bar lambda, which both are, require either a neutron or a proton, we are sensitive to th this neutron skin in that if the neutron skin gets thicker, the sigma production will increase, whereas the lambda anti-lambda production will decrease. And we can define the ratio of these two production probabilities as an observable for one isotope. However, this will most likely not be enough to measure the neutron skin since we still have model dependence that may exist, for example, due to rescattering or absorption of the antihyperons in the nucleus. Furthermore, we would need exact knowledge of the cross-sections involved. Therefore, we want to com measure, uh, compare the two different, two different isotopes under some simplifying assumptions, like that, the that they have the same proton distribution, which for calcium-40 and 48 is known to be mostly true, and that the neutron density inside the nucleus is unchanged. So that two isotopes only differ by this additional neutron skin. We can then define a double ratio of the, of, for these two isotopes by dividing these production ratios and with a simple, some simple arithmetic and with additionally neglecting the absorption probability, we can derive a relatively simple formula for the double ratio, which only depends on the absorption probability of the antiproton in this additional neutron skin, which can, we can then further develop in the first order and show that, oops, that this is proportional uh, to, the, to the neutron skin thickness and the, only the cross-section of antiproton to nucleus. Furthermore, by using this double ratio, we can uh, suppress many systematic effects, for example, the detector acceptance and, efficient, and efficiencies, and also the rescattering. And since this is only dependent on the uh, absorption of the neutron skin, we expect that the influence of the proton antiproton to lambda anti-lambda cross-section will also be mostly eliminated. But of course, this is a very simplified geometrical picture which has some deficiencies. For example, not all antiprotons will traverse the neutron skin radially, so that the absorption probability will actually depend on the impact parameter, which we have not taken into account in, the, in our simplified model. Furthermore, the absorption of produced antihyperons, which we ignored in the first step, is of course important since we need to measure these antihyperons, lambda, lambda bar, and for this they need to leave the nuclei, thus it may, might be favoring peripherally produced pairs, and thus will depend on the neutron skin thickness. And finally, of course, there is some slight modification of the proton distribution for different isotopes, which has to be taken into account. Therefore, we use a more realistic simulation to verify the sensitivity of the double ratio to the variation of the neutron skin. And for this, we are using the GBU software framework, which is a relativistic mean field transport model. And on the Mogon 2 supercomputer at the University of Mainz, we simulated 28 million events at 2.4 GeV over C for each isotope. These simulations are rather computationally impact expensive, costing approximately one day with 1,000 threads running concurrently. And the, the number of events we are getting is approximately five seconds of Panda runtime. Of course, in our study, we consider all pairs as reconstructable, and in reality, we would have to take detector efficiency and so on into account. But even with pessimistic uh, uh, assumptions, 
this is something in the order of a few hours of measurement time. Uh, to, now to other data. We first calculate the xenon isotope chain as a proof of principle, since this has many stable isotopes with sufficient abundance, and the standard Penta configuration uses a gas jet target. On the right side, uh, the workflow we are using is always the same. First, we extract the relativistic mean field model's nuclear distribution, which is shown here on the right. You see the, from xenon the neutron and proton radius for the different isotopes. And in comparison, down here are the charge radios from experiments for xenon. And we can see, if you look at this, it's, it's, it's relatively compatible with the GBU nuclear distribution. And this nuclear distribution is then used to calculate in our simplified geometric model the double ratio, but also to, for the GBU simulations, which gives us the production ratios of sigma and lambda, which we can then use to calculate the double ratio. At this point, we are not so much interested in reproducing our input values, but rather our goal is to show the sensitivity of uh, this double ratio to the neutron skin thickness. And if we can look at this picture, it shows the calculated double ratios for xenon isotopes. And in violet, we can see the schematic calculation of the simplified model, and in green, the GBU result. And we can see this matches rather nicely. And we repeated this measurement to check also with krypton isotopes, which gives us the same result. So we conclude that this double ratio from the GBU simulation is related to the neutron skin thickness, which is assumed as an input here. However, the isotopic poor gas targets are extremely expensive, since we would need in the order of 100 grams of material. And uh, solid state targets are, however, much more affordable, since we would only need some micrograms. Therefore, we are currently looking at calcium-40 and 48 as target. These are of great interest since they are both double magic nuclei, and it is known that they have a nearly identical proton distribution. Furthermore, ab initio calculations are possible in modern theory, which allows us a comparison with theoretical predictions. And most importantly, it is, uh, the neutron skin thickness of calcium-48 is expected to be strongly related to that of lead-208. On the right side, we see the neutron skin thickness of calcium-48, and we can see there's still a major spread of the measured results. And if we look at the rightmost cyan uh, data point from the preliminary data of C-Rex, and compare this with the P-Rex 2 data shown below, we can see there's some tension between these least model-dependent measurements. So any new measurement of calcium should be welcome. To calculate this, this um, double ratios, we again simulated 80 million events at 2.4 GeV and predict a simple, with our simplified model a double ratio of 1.37, whereas our GBU calculation give a matching result of 1.41 plus minus 0 0.03. And if we, uh, cor this corresponds to a relative statistical error of the neutron skin thickness of approximately 10%. And this is with even pessimistic assumptions, only five hours of panda measurement time. So if we measure a week, we expect this error to be less than 1%. Of course, we still need to study systematic errors and their uncertainties. And for this, we will look at the reaction cross-sections. In panda, we can measure the relevant cross-sections on proton and deuterium. But we need to check that the sensitivity of the double ratio on this neutron skin thickness is, is uh, with varying GB, uh, cross-sections in GBU is also there. And furthermore, we still need to implant different neutron distributions to, to explore the sensitivity of the double ratio under changing distributions. Last but not least, for the future, we need to look at the neutron detection in PANDA. Uh, this is already possible in phase two of PANDA when we have an electro electronic magnet electromagnetic calorimeter. But uh, we still need to do PANDA root studies if we can really reconstruct the events. So in summary, we have shown here a new method to measure the neutron skin variation for different for isotope pair using antiprotons. This measurement requires a short measuring time for high statistics, meaning we looking at small statistical errors. And the double ratio, which is a very simple observable, shows a large sensitivity for the, on the neutron skin thickness. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much for a very nice presentation. We have time for a few questions. So I don't see, let me ask about any um, ideas or for perspectives for other isotopes to consider, other isotopes except you discussed. Yeah, we're all, of course, this, is, this matters works with every yeah. isotope pr in principle. So any plans? <laughs> yeah, we, are looking, we will look at tin isotopes mm -hmm. since they are single magic nuclei mm -hmm. and therefore also very interesting and there should also be isotopes that are quite available and mm -hmm. tin is no problem as the target material, so that should be easy. I think so. Okay, thank you. So, if uh, we don't have more questions, so let's thank our speaker once again. <laughs> and we move to the last presentation during our session, uh, Carlos Merino with multi strange hyperon production on nuclear targets. I first. Yeah, first. Oh, sorry. Yes, so now we should have investigation of the uh, sigma zero. Yes. Sorry, I don't have this information. Okay, while it is small, with investigation of the sigma zero production mechanism. Could you please start? Hello. Can you hear us? We can't hear you. Uh, good afternoon. Better. Okay. Or? Okay. So, whenever you're ready, please start your presentation. You have 12 minutes plus three minutes for discussion. Yeah. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, yeah, I will talk, uh, talk about the investigation of the sigma zero uh, hydron production mechanism in uh, proton proton collision at proton beam energy uh, 3.5 GeV. And this is uh, the data collected by Hades uh, in 2007. So first of all, uh, I'd like to give an overview of uh, why we do this uh, study. Uh, in general, the study of the high production um, can serve as a tool to study the uh, strong interaction and the quantum of thermodynamics at the uh, confinement scale. That's because the mass of the range uh, high is close to the confinement scale of the PCD. And this is also crucial for the uh, model calculation for heavy ion uh, collisions. Uh, parameters, output parameters of this type of uh, measurement, such as the cross section, for example, can be used as the parameters for the simulation of heavy ion collisions. And in addition to this, also there are a uh, few measurements of the sigma zero compared to the, um, uh, the ground state line lambda hydrogen production. And the focus here of this study is on the exclusive reaction that's um, uh, basically proton proton going to proton uh, k on uh, sigma zero. And the sigma zero decays 100% uh, of the time to lambda photon. And the photon is not detected in this case and measured as um, a missing particle. And the lambda decays or even extracted by the, by the decay motor proton by minus. So we have uh, four uh, uh, final state charger particles in addition to the photon. That's basically primary proton, direct proton, and, and the secondary proton, and time plus the photon. And on the right here, we see the Hades uh, cross-section view of the Hades detector that is described um, previously by uh, previous talks by Simon and Raphael. And uh, uh, what I would like to indicate here is that there is a forward wall um, that's basically a scintillating photoscope that can measure the arrival time of uh, tracks. So it can measure uh, it or provide it with arrival time of tracks from the interaction point. So let me go directly to the um, analysis strategy. And the analysis strategy is um, consists of two main steps, the two main um, um, uh, uh, steps, analysis steps. That's basically the sigma reconstruction and the study of the physics of the sigma hydron production. And in the sigma reconstruction, I have um, uh, three steps. That's basically the particle identification and then the reconstruction of the intermediate lambda um, hydron. And I then apply a kinematic reset in order to um, uh, remove the background and to give a better, uh, better estimate of the mass resolution of the mass of the sigma and the um, lambda hydron. And 
then the physics of the sigma um, titan production that I study the final state particles. In the final state particles, they need to make a primary proton, the K and, and the regional structure sigma hydron. And this is done in various uh, reference frames, such as the center fast frame, the Dr. Jackson frame, and the velocity frame. And finally, uh, I uh, will present to you a partial wave analysis of this um, the channel. So I go to the first step of the signal reconstruction with the DID. And the DID here is that I have to identify the tracks in the final state. That's given the track, what is the particle type? And I have here um, in my final state two um, uh, charge of particles that I have to identify. That's basically a uh, proton, K on N. In addition to this, I have a negative exposure time. Uh, the charge here um, uh, can be provided by the measurement of the temperature of like inside the magnetic field. And the PID is done here, of course, performing key based on deep learning techniques. And what I have uh, uh, done here is to, to um, train an autoencoder uh, that's using the same supervised technique that's to train simultaneously on simulation and data. In order to avoid any systematic bias that can um, that can happen if I train only in the simulation, and I have as the training features here the momentum component and energy loss and the time of flight, and the model is what we see here. And this autoencoder is basically an, an artificial neural network that consists of two main components. One is called the encoder part, and the other is called the decoder. And the encoder takes both the simulation and data and it tries to uh, understand or learn the features, uh, the combined features of data and simulation and compress it into the latent space. The decoder tries to reconstruct the learned representation or the compressed representation from this latent space. So one can benefit from the learned representation to, um, to do the classification task that's basically back on top of this. A classification layer to classify the tracks into either protons, proteins, or ions. As the accuracy of this network, I have uh, for protons classification accuracy uh, 98%, for ions 92%, and for canes 76%. And for canes, is much uh, lower than um, the proton and ions, but the canes are suppressed uh, with respect to the proton and ions. Then the second step is. The lambda hydron uh, reconstruction, the intermediate lambda hydron. And at this stage, I um, divide or uh, do this reconstruction at two fold. That basically I have two data sets one I call the spectrometer data set, and one I call the wall data set. And then this spectrometer data set, I require that um, all final state charger particles to be within the acceptance of the main. Spectrometer. That's basically the two protons, ion and pi minus. And then we construct the lambda using um, a topological cut since lambda decay deeply. One can use uh, this to reconstruct the lambda. And in addition to this, I apply a missing mass cut. That's uh, in this case the missing mass square of the proton lambda that should correspond to the mass square of the ion proton. I require this to be greater than 0.2. And this uh, uh, is introduced basically to reject the multi-band production by this histogram. So what you, you see in uh, this histogram is uh, the missing mass squared of the uh, proton lambda, and the data shown by the um, uh, back dots, and the uh, different simulation channels show, shown by different colors here. Around zero, you, should, you see the, uh, the peak corresponding to multi prime production, that's basically proton, proton, pi, pi, pi minus, uh, pi plus. And the second peak is um, the sum of the three main channels, that's basically the signal, theta plus sigma, plus beta plus lambda, and beta plus lambda pi. In the world that I said, the difference here is that I require only three of the final state uh, charger particles to be in the mean. Um, detector acceptance, in addition to one head in the forward wall. And I assume this head is due to the decay um, proton for the secondary proton of the number decay. And because there are no track information in this case, I rely completely on the missing mass. It's again the missing mass of the P lambda, the 
of square root of v lambda greater than 0.2. And because there is a fourth and then the final state, I will try the missing map of all charge of particles. That's p lambda k to p within the mass window of the fourth one that's being between, between minus 0.02 and 0.01. Finally, what you see here is the uh, invariant mass distribution of the uh, decay proton and pi minus for both that step. So you see that the, um, uh, the width of uh, the wall data set, the mass resolution of the wall data set is worse than uh, the mass resolution in the case of that spectrometer data set. And that's because of the time resolution of the uh, forward wall. So finally, I read Ms. Ragda Lambda based on the missing mass spectrum of the proton, K1. This should correspond to the mass of the spectrum. But before this, I apply a kinematic reset, which is basically a constraint set, where I constrain the mass of the prime of the second degree proton and ion to the lambda mass. And I constrain the missing mass of the, prime, uh, the primary proton, K1, and the lambda to the photon, which is easy. And then I select the events for the confidence level greater than 1%. So what you see here is this uh, missing mass of the primary proton K and after the dynamatic reset. And then I select the, last, the sigma candidates based on a, a mass window. And finally, I've seen um, uh, a number of events around 2,600 2, events. So the signal purity is generated from the simulation, about 81%, and the background coming mainly from the peak of last lambda, which is the main background here, and the peak of last lambda lies deeper. So now I go to the physics result that to study the uh, final state particles and various reference frames, and I have here, um, I show to you here, uh, to you here the um, angular distribution of the final state particles in the center of mass. Frame. And these are the corrected angular distribution corrected for the efficiency and acceptance of the detector. On the y-axis, you see the cross-section. And on, this, on the x-axis, you see the, um, uh, the angular distribution, the angle uh, of the type one. And here in this plot, you see the angle of the proton. And on the, on the right plot, you see the angle of the case. The data, again, is represented here by the black dots. And the uh, uh, blue line here represents the phases simulation. In order to um, to quantify the anisotropy of these angular distribution, each one of these plots has been set for the Legenda um, um, polynomial, where the set parameters are shown here, A0 and A2. And from uh, the angular distribution of the height of the proton, one can estimate that there is an anisotropic production of the sigma in the proton, where in this case, in the proton case, more pronounced than in the sigma, as also quantified by the A2 parameter here. And this could be an indication to a pion exchange mechanism that the initial proton, <coughs> the initial proton proton system exchange a pion in order to produce the final state particles. So if one considers a pion exchange, for example, the because the pion has a small mass, there will be a small uh, full momentum transfer in this case to the proton, such that the proton will preferably emit in the direction of the initial proton in the center of mass frame that could exist in the analysis of um, uh, shown here in the proton. Well, this is not observed in the ion, the uh, A2 parameter here. You have three minutes left. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's, cons it's consistent with isotope. Now I go to the Gottfried Jackson frame that uh, basically could explain if there is a resonant contribution or not. <clears throat> and the Gottfried Jackson frame is basically the frame, the rest of the frame of the two of the final state particles, and the angle is measured uh, between one of the two uh, uh, particles here with respect to the initial problem. And this could provide information about the resonance if, if any resonance is included in the, the production of the hydrogen. And as you can see, these are um, not isotropic distribution, which could indicate that there are more than one nuclear resonance included into the production. To give a better uh, uh, picture about the resonance contribution, I looked also at the velocity frames, which are um, a special direction of the balance plot. And again, what you see here that these angular distributions are far from isotropic 
which is again a clear indication of horizontal contribution. So in order to <coughs> to give a better estimate of the or a precise estimate of the resonant contributions, we did a partial wave analysis that's basically using a bond gachina, a partial wave analysis tool. And this is based on an event by event setting, um, log likely food minimization. And what I to you here is again the same velocity angle distribution, but now compared to the first partial wave analysis solution. And the agreement between the data points and the first partial wave analysis solution is, provides a good description of these um, uh, angular distribution. And the resonance involved here are NSR 1710, NSR 1900, and NSR 1900. Finally, the production cross section is uh, calculated and found to be 19 microparm. And uh, this is shown here by the green box and um, uh, compared to other um, cross section from other experiments as a function of excess energy. Yeah, this uh, brings me to uh, the summary. What I present to you is an investigation of the sigma uh, production in proton proton collision. And the main message here is that the thesis case description of data is not sufficient. And we must include um, uh, nuclear resonance, basically. Uh, NSR uh, 1710 and uh, NSR and Delta Star 1900 in order to provide a better description of, um, of experimental data. Uh, However, due to the limited statistics, there is a, a significant uncertainty in this um, uh, contribution or reason of contributions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for interesting talk. So, uh, any question or comment or a speaker? Uh, let me ask uh, whether in your studies you use the whole available statistics or do you still have some data that you could consider? Yes, this is all data and this is data collected. Um, That's what I thought, okay. Use it by Okay. Okay, I don't see more questions, so let's thank our speaker once again. And also let's thank other speakers during the session, because the session is over. See you tomorrow.